It is an honour for me to address you and also to thank Diego. Do you want to stand up, Diego, who was my trusty assistant and uh, put up with many, many hours. Thank you. Now, the bad news was that at uh, 10 o'clock last night, this paper was 24,000 words. Um, the good news is that by midnight, it was uh, 15,000 words. But if it's a bit long and you'd rather go and have a nice dinner, I fully understand. So, uh, so uh, I'll see what I can do. Look, I've had a long career in the financial service industry globally, and most of my professional life has been devoted to fixing foul banks. Um, I've worked on bailouts in the United States, Australia, Europe and Asia. And despite these regional differences, there's a remarkable commonality to the cause and effect of their failure, restructuring and resolution. And when financial crises do occur, as they seem to do with remarkable regularity, we see very important people looking very serious, making very sage announcements that everything will be okay, but we nevertheless, we sort of figure out what is actually going on and we're none the wiser as to why this has occurred. Because for most people, the notion of safe as a bank is dearly held. From the time we are young, putting a few coins into a piggy bank, to our first school banking account, insuring our first car, nervously meeting with a bank manager about a housing loan and now using ATMs and internet banking, financial institutions are the very bedrock of our own financial stability. And 100 years ago, people would go to Martin Place and look at the magnificence of the banking chamber had been cocooned in its safety, security and stability. That was the impression. So when a financial crisis does actually occur, there's a huge amount of confusion and a sense of disbelief. As safe as a bank and global financial crisis sit very frankly uncomfortably with each other as a sort of perplexing financial oxymoron. And if you look at historical photographs of banking runs, you'll see a dazed and frightened public lining up to withdraw their deposits with no idea what they'll do to their money. And it's because the financial sector is so central to a functioning economy that when things go wrong, the impact is so widespread and devastating. And so in this lecture, what I'm going to do is start with the basics of banking, then explain the inherent conflict of interest between depositors and bank regulators and bank shareholders, and look at how regulators arbitrate this, look at the cause and effects of financial failures and the regulatory response to this, and finally, having looked at the broader aspects of the financial sector in Australia and internationally, particularly around what's called the too big to fail conundrum, I will give my recommendations for reforming the Australia's banking sector in G20 world. It's a very broad canvas um, and I'm, I hope to do justice to it, particularly with my alma mater. So I'm going, to do, I'm going to use a bit of technology here, which I'm not very good at. I'm going to use a slide. Oh, there we go. So look, here's the financial services sector. What you can see pretty well, if you look at it, is that the deposit-taking institutions are absolutely massive in terms of $3.3 trillion of assets. Um, life insurance companies and superannuations, obviously $1.8 billion, but the rest of the sector is actually rather small. If we then look at the market sector participants by market capitalisation, uh, it becomes fairly obvious what the sector looks like. And if you think about that NAB, which is the smallest of the four trading banks, has four times the market capitalisation of the next largest institution, either Macquarie or Suncorp, and that CBA is six times that, you can see the sector that is absolutely dominated from a financial perspective by the four trading banks. If we then look at the banks by market capitalisation, um, remembering that Australia is 2% of the world's GDP, out of the 25 top banks by market capitalisation around the world, we have all four of our trading banks in there. So four out of the 25 largest institutions by market capitalisation are in Australia. Now that we have a snapshot of the financial sector as a whole, let's begin with the fundamentals of banking, uh, and in particular the banking sector, which is the most important component of, of a financial sector. Now we know the expression lies, damn lies in statistics, but very few people realise the expression as safe as a bank is a myth. Banking by its very and activity is a fundamentally unsafe undertaking. It's an unsafe undertaking which also involves monumentally huge numbers, huge numbers of customers, huge numbers of capital,
and vastly huger amounts of deposits, borrowings, loans and assets. Let me demonstrate this by comparing the balance sheets of Commonwealth Bank and Westpac with those of BHP and Rio. So that we have the two largest banks and two largest mining companies headquartered. Now, the thing that I want you to focus on is a line that says equity ratio and financial leverage. So we have an institution such as Combank, which has about $800, trillion in, $800 billion in uh, assets, where Shell's equity of only $50 million. Uh, it has an equity ratio of 6.2%. Compare that with BHP and Rio, which are 50%. If we look at the leverage involved, which is over 16, uh, and you look at the leverage of BH, BHP and Rio, they're entirely different. But then, interestingly enough, the banks are higher rated. So you go, how is an institution that's only got 6% 6, 6 equity leverage ratio had a double AA, A double A rating, whereas BHP, which has obviously got a lot more, lot more equity in it, has a lower rating? Now, there's a trick to this because it would have seemed to be illogical. Now, the important point to make is if the, if the banks were, had the same ratio, in other words, they were levered at 16 to 1, they would be regarded as junk by the rating agencies. So they have a leverage ratio which in the non-financial world is a junk rating, but in the financial world they have a double A rating. And if you think that Combank and Westpac are highly levered, the, Goldman, the global investment banks including Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley were levered at 30 to 1 and even 40 to 1 prior to the GFC. So by and large, banks globally have similar leverage structures. They borrow a lot of money on a slim capital base. And as of today, the major Australian trading banks have got three trillion of assets supported by a capital base of only 170 billion. So once this is understood, this concept of leverage, it's not difficult to understand that bank failures are not incomprehensible aberrations, but inherent to the very enterprise itself. And indeed, if the true risk embodied in financial institutions reflected their published balance sheets, they would not be financially viable at all. And they would be unable to attract investors to, to invest in them. So the trick to banking and the process of credit intermediation as a whole is that the economic leverage in a bank is far less than the accounting leverage disclosed in its balance sheet. In other words, the economic leverage of Combank and Westpac is far less than the 16.1 accounting leverage of accurate assets that you see and it supports their ratings. So where does this enhanced economic leverage come from? Well, the shells of a bank create and contribute to a balance sheet. But in addition to this, everyone who has a mortgage or a bank loan also contributes capital. This contributed capital is the amount of collateral that every individual or business contributes by way of down payment on their mortgage or corporate loan. Without this contributed capital, the entire financial system could not actually function because it would be far more risky than it is. Therefore, the economic risk inherent in banking is a function of its balance sheet capital plus its contributed capital compared with the riskiness of its loans and assets on its balance sheet and the, some of these assets are corporate loans and government bonds. To demonstrate the importance of contributed capital, let's look at the simple illustration of a standard 25-year housing loan. For the purpose of analysis, we are going to assume that the loan is paid off in equal annual installments over 25 years, although in practice housing loans turn over less than five years on average. So the price of the house in question is half a million dollars, with a loan-to-value ratio, an LVR of 90%. So the first thing we see, and you'll see this in a minute, is the borrower has initially contributed $50,000 to the home price. The bank has provided $450,000 as a loan, and this loan from the bank's perspective is an asset in its balance sheet. So when the loan's first entered into, the borrower has provided $50,000 of contributed capital to the transaction. In simple terms, if the value of the home falls during an economic cycle of more than 10%, this decline in the price of the home is referred to as negative equity by the banks. 
Now the really interesting observation is that as the mortgage is paid off over time, the amount of contributed capital made by the homeowner to the transaction increases from 10% in year one to 96% in year, whoops. No, they've missed that, yeah. In, um, in year 24. So what, what we've got here is a chart. You can see from the slide that in year 13, the value of the same house would have to fall more than 50% before the bank shells were at risk in terms of their balance sheet capital. In year one, if the, if the price of the house fell by more than 10%, it would imperil the bank shareholders. But by year 13, because of the loan paydowns and the contributed capital increasing, then the bank has got a more secure position. So the price of the house would, would have to fall by more than 50% before its own balance sheet capital was impacted. So when you see the true economic risk in a mortgage structure, you can see why banks are very keen to provide this product. There are a lot of advantages to mortgage loans in terms of regulatory capital, which I'll deal with later on. Now it's important to note that the contributed capital provided by customers in a transaction does not belong to the bank. It belongs to the customer. And as such, its only role is to protect the bank's balance sheet from the economic risk in a transaction, and a bank can't draw upon it in a financial crisis. It can only use its own balance sheet capital. Contributed capital cannot be amalgamated or summed to protect a bank's capital. So for example, you may have a surplus of contributed capital in total in a bank's portfolio of mortgage loans, but a deficit in commercial or property loans, which is sufficient to imperil the bank's balance sheet as a credit of failure. Now, this sounds a bit complicated, so I'm gonna give you a very simple example. So what we have here is three loans. A housing loan, an SME loan, and a commercial loan. Now, at, as of today, we have that on the, on, the, on the top chart, you'll see that the bank has balance sheet capital of $125,000 against total assets of one and a half million. Now, let's assume there's a financial crisis or the bank has over lent to the, to the commercial loan and it, it declines by, by 70%. Note that the housing loan and the SME loan have not changed in value at all. There is no difference to their contributed capital. But the problem that the bank faces is that the commercial loan has now declined from $500,000 to $150,000, which in itself is enough to wipe out the contributed capital into the deficit, which then affects its balance sheet capital. This is really important because as we look to financial crisis, people say, well, look, all the mortgages in housing went all right, but a few bad apples brought down the whole system. It's because the contributed capital does not belong to the bank, it's only the individuals, and if there's, if there's poor loans in the portfolio, that in itself is enough to create a crisis. Now, just in case you were wondering, what we've actually done just now is to create a bank stress test. You've read about this. This is what's being applied to the major financial institutions in Europe. What we have done is to hypothetically reduce asset values in a simulated banking crisis to observe is there a call on balance sheet capital arising from the reduction in contributor capital across asset classes. As I said, a housing and SME loan were perfectly fine, but the commercial loan created a major solvency from the problem. So what is the purpose of contributor capital and balance sheet capital anyway? It's only got one role, which is protect depositors' money. When an individual or company makes a deposit, I think this, uh, I'll come back to that. When an individual or company makes a deposit with a bank, it's an absolute given that its money can be withdrawn at a moment's notice. That is, it's at call. It, this withdrawal may be at a bank branch, it may be through an ATM overseas, it may be paying an electricity bill. But the deposit belongs to the customer and is held on trust by the bank as custodian. Without this absolute given, the entire economy would come to a standstill. Can you imagine every time you went to pay a bill, you were not sure that the bank had enough money to pay to, to affect your transaction? Now, when people do feel this way, 
depositors start lining, lining up and it's what is called a bank run and it's happened on numerous occasions around the world and most recently in Australia in the 1980s when St George was a building society it had a, it had a run on it. Well then you'd say okay well let's think about an ideal world wouldn't depositors then say, well, we'd like to have a bank with a balance sheet like BHP Billiton rather than Westpac or Combank? Well, of course not. Every deposit in Australia or any other country of the matter has absolutely no idea about banks and their balance sheets. They just assume that when they want their money, it will be there. They don't think about, they don't think about balance sheet capital, contributor capital, regulatory capital, they just want their money and they assume the system will be there. Well, therefore, well, who does think about these things? Well, historically, bank was a highly entrepreneurial activity. Citizens, sometimes worthy, sometimes not, would put up some money as capital and commence the enterprise of borrowing and lending money. And over time, and with good reason, after depositors lost their money in numerous bank failures, governments and regulators began to protect honest, honest ordinary folks. They had, they had new regulations govern these institutions, which either held or sought a banking licence, and imposed increasingly sophisticated licensing requirements on them, including how much capital shareholders need to provide. Further, with the development of larger financial institutions operating in multiple jurisdictions, the regulatory framework has actually morphed from the national sphere to the international sphere. But nationally or supranationally, regulators still need to balance the interests of depositors with those of bank shareholders. Shareholders have to get an economic return on their investment. So let's superimpose what happened if Westpac did look like BHP. I think that's correct. Yep. Now if we, if we look at this slide, what we've now done is we've said, okay, let's make, we've, we've superimposed the Shell's equity relationship that, that BHP has on Westpac. One problem, look at the return on equity. Westpac's return on equity goes from 18% to less than 2%. And any, any bank that is uh, offering its investors a 2% return on equity won't be in business for very long. So the problem that the, the regulators have is between this whole concept of leverage and return, to, and return to shareholders. So financial regulators are in the, the business, either explicitly or implicitly, of arbitrating the conflict of interest between depositors and shareholders. A stronger capital position assists depositors, but it can't be the expense of diminishing shareholder returns to an unacademic level. Further, there are competitive aspects in terms of uh, driving out marginal players and, and which impact customer choice. So even in bank bailouts, remember, new capital can only be formed for the surviving entity if the providers of capital believe they can get a satisfactory return taken for the risk of their investment. And so, as I'll discuss later, financial regulators have a very significant role in determining the economics of banking that most people don't realise. So let's turn to the ordinary honest depositor. Outside a very small elite, nobody has any idea about the arcane world of bank capital and balance sheets. And I'm surprised you're probably, when you saw that demonstration, think, oh, I didn't really think about that. People just assume the, function, the, the system will function. But what happens when we do have a bank failure? Who ends up actually guaranteeing the safety and security deposits money and the banking system as a whole? Well, governments do. It's only governments that have the financial resources to protect depositors because, we're, as we've seen, when a crisis results in the diminution of asset values as to overwhelm contributed capital and look at only look at balance sheet capital on a proportional basis and not very much balance sheet capital to support the system. So time and time again it's governments and taxpayers that have ended up ensuring depositing their money back and the banking system actually functions as it should. And this is a unique benefit provided to banks and, in, and sometimes an insurance company which no other private sector company could, could dream of. As recently as the last financial crisis, the government of Ireland guaranteed its entire banking system only to find that the guarantee bankrupted the entire country, which then had to go to the IMF. You can see what happens here. So now we've looked at the structure of a balance sheet from the perspective of capital and assets and discussed the protection of depositors. Now, if this wasn't complex enough, we need to look at another unique feature of financial systems globally,
and Australia in particular, which is the timing mismatch between a bank's obligation to repay its depositors' money at call and a borrower's obligation to repay a bank loan which may stretch over years or decades. This is referred to as duration risk, or in the vernacular, borrowing short, lending long. And the greater the duration event, the more likely a bank can and will suffer a liquidity event in a banking crisis. Let me go back to simplify this by looking at our half a million dollar house purchase. At the closing, the purchaser provides a bank cheque of $50,000, remember they contributed capital to the vendor, and the bank provides a 25-year amortising loan and del delivers a bank cheque for $450,000 to the vendor. The vendor's now got the half a million dollars, the bank takes possession of the title lease for the property, it keeps pending the full repayment of the mortgage after 25 years or earlier if sold. Well, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Well, not really from an economic perspective, because what the bank has just entered into is a 25-year mortgage contract. That is, assuming the borrower doesn't go into default, it will get its money back gradually over 25 years. And there are rarely defaults. So then, therefore, we have to say, well, wait a minute. Well, how did the bank then finance this $450,000 loan, which is not going to get back for 25 years? And what are its, its obligations to it, the people who finance the bank? What I can tell you we'd all know from looking around is there is no such thing as a 25-year deposit. In an ideal world, there'd be 25-year deposits, that, which would be on offer for the banks, and people would go along and say, I'll put my money out for 25 years. They would loan 25-year money, and we'd have no duration risk. There'd be no problem. But of course, that doesn't occur, and it, and it can't even occur overseas. Banks don't go overseas and saying, I'm lending Mr. and Mrs. Bruce Hall $450,000, what I need to do is borrow half a million dollars of 25-year, 450,000 of 25-year uh, money. What it actually does in reality is it finances its $450,000 with a combination of at-call deposits, overnight borrowings, 30, 60 and 90 day medium term notes in the Euro and US markets. Occasionally banks borrow longer term, five to 10 years, but it's a very, very small portion of the liability structure. So the existential problem that all banks face in a liquidity crisis is that depositors, small and large, can uh, demand immediately they withdraw their money to be able to take it out back, but a bank cannot turn around and demand that a mortgage holder or a borrower repay that money immediately to pay back the depositor. That's the problem that is created in a liquidity crisis. And the greater duration mismatch and the narrower the financing of a bank, if it's in different countries, opposed to got a broad, broad financing base, the more likely it is to fail because it runs out of money. Now, you may have a home that's worth half a million dollars, but if you've got nothing in your bank account, you can't pay your mortgage back, the, the bank will take your home away, even though you may have equity in it. So it's very important, liquidity is very important to the system, just as it is for individuals. Now, the financing of the Australian banks during the GFC became a major systemic problem for the entire economy, which is, it still is today, and I'm going to turn to this later on. And it's exacerbated by a tax regime which penalises Australian deposits, creating disincentive to save through this mechanism, and therefore our financial system is over-reliant on offshore borrowings. And this problem of offshore borrowings was particularly acute for the non-trading banks, including Macquarie, St George and Suncorp at the GFC. So therefore, what we need to do is to, we need to look at, at what the, the, the major banks are doing, and they are amongst the very largest borrowers in the global debt markets of all institutions, despite the relative modest size of Australia's GDP, relative to global GDP, global GDP about 74, 74 and a half trillion, we're about 1.6, and yet our banks are some of the biggest borrowers. Now, liquidity is one of a large number of banks, sorry, risks that banks have to manage. There's concentration risk, geographic risk, counterparty risk, credit risk, duration risk, reputational risk, default risk, interest rates, risk, and others. Now, it will come as a surprise 
to, to many people that within the financial sector globally, most employees within the financial sector have little or no idea about how their institution manages these risks. Tomorrow, go to your local branch manager and ask her, how do you manage liquidity risk or duration risk? You will get nothing but a look of bafflement. What are you talking about? So the, the complex class of task of managing these risks and the balance sheet as a whole is vested at the very highest level of bank in what is called an Asset Liability Committee, ALCO. It is only here amongst a select few that all the information about bank risk and the bank balance sheet is pulled together and managed. Governments, however, have found themselves in the business of having to understand these risks, regulate them, and in certain cases even prescribe limits on certain types of loans and other assets in order to protect depositors' money and the safety and security of the financial system as a whole. Now, in Australia, the financial sector is overseen by a number of bodies under the umbrella of the Council of Financial Regulators, CFR. The chairman of the CFR is Glenn Stevens, the Governor of the Reserve Bank. Other representatives include the Australian Treasury, the Australian Prudential Regulatory Authority, APRA, and the Australian Securities and Investments Commission. Uh, the RBA provides a secretariat, uh, and I'll get into this later, but a notable non-member is the Competition Authority, the ACCC. Now, financial sector supervision is more from a national regulators to supranational regulators. The most important one is the BIS in Switzerland, the Bank of International Settlements, which was established in 1930 after the Wall Street crash. The BIS, of which Australia is a member, is the global regulator of the international banking system and additionally provides very useful commentary about the state of the global economy and financial markets in particular. The BIS is most well known for establishing and revising global capital rules relating to the treatment of bank risk and capital known as the BIS regime for capital adequacy. And since 1988, there's been three iterations of the BIS rules, namely BIS 1, BIS 2, and now BIS 3, sort of very creative names. This has been currently implemented by banks and being overseen by domestic regulators. Held by banks and insurance companies have different risks. What the BIS, which we've seen in the previous chart, what the BIS regime does is to ensure that globally banks treat the same assets the same way and they are risk weighted in an identical manner with identical capital applied against those to ensure that depositors have access to identical capital within the sort of risk they're taking. So the whole idea is to have a minimum capital standards to protect depositors. Remember I said that banking is, is an undersafe undertaking involving monumentally huge numbers. So in order to come to grips in the BIS setting, it's important to note that there are two variables. The risk weighting of assets, the numerator, and the capital required as a percentage of those risk weighted assets denominator. I'm going to explain this a bit more. The trick here is that national regulators such as APRA can play with both the numerator and the denominator and the net result is the absolute level of capital held by an institution and within the country itself. So I'm going to demonstrate this. A bank may have a higher level of capital adequacy but a, a lower absolute level of a bank with an identical portfolio depending on how the regulator looks at, at risk weighting the asset treatment. Now, recall the expression I had, lies, damn lies, and statistics. Now, Australia has a preponderance of housing loans compared with corporate loans financed by the banking sector. Indeed, we have the highest proportion of housing loans of a, any major economy in the world. We are quite an outlier, as you can see from that. So the calculation of how these loans are treated by APRA has a major impact on the absolute level of capital in the banking system. Now in its wisdom, APRA treats a, house, a housing loan originated by a major trading bank entirely differently from the same loan originated by a regional bank. Originated by a regional bank. So if we look at the risk weightings for on balance sheets, selected on balance sheet assets. What I want you to look at is, is forget some of the other weightings. I'll get to, uh, two things. Look at, look at the, uh, 
the ratings on uh, AA and AA minus uh, securities, which have a zero capital allocation required. But look at the mortgages. Now, look at the zero to 80, which is 35, 90, 80, to, 80 to 90 LVR, and 90 to 100. What's it actually showing is APRA is incorporating this concept of contributor capital in the way it looks at ca in the capital ratios. Because they're saying the more contributor capital by people you're transacting with, in other words, the home loan, the more, the more favourable capital treatment you'll get. So you can observe this. Um, now, what APRA permits the Australian trading banks to do is determine the risk weightings for a home loan under an advanced modelling technique. This means that the major banks, unlike the regional banks, do not use this approach. They determine how much capital they need. And, in, in, and actually, it's a lot less than what the regional banks are required to do. So think about it, a loan originated by a regional bank has a lot higher capital requirement than the same loan originated by a major bank. This is anti-competitive and it's distortion to the market and it also means in terms of international comparisons about which banks of which capital, it's undermining one of the key features of the BIS regime which is consistency of credit risk applications across global jurisdictions. I'm going to give an example of this. So the Australian collective bank, banks collectively, the majors, have actually less than a 20% risk weighted applied to their total home portfolio, which makes a huge difference to the capital required to hold by APRA, particularly, as I said, given the importance of housing stock in the market. Now, what I'm going to do here is, is to say, there are two banks in the economy where we have a $3 trillion book. There's two banks, major bank and regional bank. Major bank, forget all the numbers, regional bank is able to uh, risk weight its housing portfolio, which is 70% of its, of its book, at 18% capital, but it uses a 10% capital a ratio. So that's the first line. The regional bank um, has to apply a 30% risk weighting, but only has an 8% capital buffer. Now, that, I sound this a bit confusing, but let me go into it a bit more detail. The major bank has 63.9 billion of absolute capital with an equity to assets ratio of 4.26%, but shows a BIS capital ratio of 10%. The regional bank, because it's being more penalised on the way the risk weighted assets are done for, for housing loans, actually ends up with more absolute capital, 64.5 billion, has a better leverage ratio, but looks worse on a BIS capital ratio. Now, if you're the management of regional bank, you might be pretty annoyed about this, and you might complain about the Murray inquiry. You might even be more annoyed when the head of the central bank, who is coincidentally the chairman of the Council of Financial Regulators, makes a submission to the same Murray inquiry that this unlevel playing field should be maintained in case it leads to an asset bubble in Australia's housing stock. The key point about this is if our domestic regulators, such as APRA, can apply such latitude in, in the numerator, the risk weighting, under a bank's modelling techniques, questions have to be asked about the result, the numerator. And you've seen how regional bank has more capital but shows a weaker capital base in its published accounts. And that's why there's so much difficulty figuring out what's going on about BIS capital globally. Now, the, the cause and effects of banks and financial crisis have been the subject of much academic and regulatory discussion. And what I'd like to do now is to go through, now you sort of understand this, um, or hope you do, is to sort of give you a bit of what, what's happened to me in terms of practice and theory. Um, most people in this audience, yeah, some of them would be too young to have experienced it, but most of the last century, until the 1980s, Australia had a highly regulated banking system in which interest rates on loans and deposits were regulated by the federal government. This was known by bankers as the rule of 363. Three. Borrow at 3, lend at 6, be on the golf course by 3pm. <laughs> so it was a very good rule. Bankers were unable to lend outside prescribed interest rates and there was actually credit rationing. For example, this happened to me, 
before being eligible for a housing loan, customers would normally have to make a deposit sizable with a bank between 18 months and two years before being considered by the bank manager for a loan. Now, all this ended the financial sector deregulation in the mid-1980s from the Campbell Inquiry and a similar deregulation of the financial markets in the United Kingdom at the same time was referred to as the Big Bang. And in 1985, the Treasurer of Australia, Paul Keating, announced that 16 banks have been approved for new banking licences, which resulted in new credit being available to the economy. The new market entrants quickly made their presence felt with the grinding of substantial corporate loans, particularly the entrepreneurial sector and for large-scale property development. Overnight, these entrepreneurs, including Alan Bond, Christopher Scase, Bruce Judge and a whole lot of financial engineers, now had access to vast amounts of money on very liberal terms, allow allowing them to buy assets all over the world at ever inflating prices. Now, after the Wall Street crash of 1987, which severely revised down the valuations of these, of these companies globally, particularly those leveraged, these go-go entrepreneurs who had borrowed from the new liberated banking sector suddenly found their market value of the acquisitions was substantial as to what they owed the banks. So the music stopped in 1988 with a resulting financial crisis in Australia and New Zealand that led to the failure then restructuring and sale of the entire state banking system, the sale of the state-owned Bank of New Zealand to NAB, and the exiting of most of the new bank entrants. Further, at the time, there was a shadow banking industry in Australia in the form of finance companies. Now, a shadow bank is nothing more than a financial service company which provides credit to consumers and businesses, normally at substantially higher interest rates, but is not entitled to fund itself with a deposit or have access to central banking facilities. So shadow banks have to issue debentures or to borrow money in the private markets or institutional markets to fund themselves, which they then on lend. Now in Australia, the large finance companies, shadow banks, such as ANZ Zasanda, were wholly owned subsidiaries and capitalised directly by the large trading banks. Customers who proposed transactions which were deemed too risky for these trading banks because a customer did not provide enough security, i.e. contributor capital, were referred by their bank managers to the very same finance companies owned by the bank. Now, theoretically, this practice bifurcated risk between the banking sector and the shadow banking sector, thereby protecting bank depositors. There was a number of practical issues here. The poor lending practice of the Australian fi finance companies led to such asset quality problems, particularly with commercial property and construction loans, that the finance companies themselves actually failed and had to be supported by the shareholders of the large banks and taxpayers in the case of bank state banks that also had uh, finance companies. Consequently, the banks and the regulators came to the realisation there was no artificial bifurcation of risk. These financial companies were absorbed into banks and effectively the financial regulators in this country have got rid of shadow banks. So today, Asanda is a business division of ANZ, but not a separate subsidiary with its own separate funding sources. Now the acquisition of assets, as we've seen in the 1980s and in other times, of uh, at ever increasing prices is referred to an asset bubble. Now central bankers and bank regulators devote a great deal of time trying to create long-term economic growth without allowing the economy to create asset bubbles or deflation in which the value of assets such as housing and commercial properties actually decline. Now, while deflation is pretty identifiable, there's a great deal of debate within academic circles and within central bank is what, what actually constitutes an as asset bubble and also <clears throat> whether it's the role of central bankers to take action before, to, to burst these before they occur. A lot of debate still goes on about what is the role of monetary policy in this. But historically there have been asset bubbles in tulips, securities, housing, internet companies, minerals, in which the financial value of these assets departs significantly from their underlying economic value. Further, these, over ass these overvalued assets need to become a large enough component of the investment arena and be funded by sufficient debt as to when this valuation balance is, is corrected, 
There is destruction of both contributed capital and balance sheet capital. In other words, you need a combination of artificially high asset prices and enough concentration in those assets to bring the system down when prices come down. The asset bubbles are normally burst either by their own volition or by central bankers recognised potential inflationary aspects and raising interest rates or applying liquidity restrictions through the banking system to prevent, uh, to prevent these asset classes being financed. Now when asset bubbles occur, it's critically important to, to look at and when they, when they, sorry, when they burst, it's very important as happened with GFC, to look at what is essentially a liquidity crisis, or in layman's terms, a crisis of confidence, with that of a fundamental deterioration of a bank's asset quality, which is sufficiently severe to degrade its balance sheet capital. Other counterparty banks are normally the first to recognise this problem and don't want to be held, holding the baby. So as a, as a banking crisis unfolds, the first thing that happens, you see, this is what you see you in, the, in the papers, the first thing that happens is banks stop lending to other banks in the interbank market. That's the first thing that happens. And the reason why they do this is they, of all people, recognise just how levered the other banks are because they are levered themselves. Also, they as an institution are scrambling as asset prices decline to figure out how much contributor capital they have at an institution and how much of a threat to this is their balance sheet capital. So what happens is banks stop lending to banks in overnight markets, the liquidity starts drying up. And the borrowing short, lending long problem of global banking starts to assert itself and it stresses the institutions. So another unique privilege extended to a company with a banking licence is the ability to turn to the central bank for funding in liquidity crisis, which is referred to as a lender of last resort. So with panic and disorder, as a result of banks not lending to other banks in the interbank market, the central banks, in Australia's case the Reserve Bank, steps in to provide liquidity. Non-banks including investment banks, do not have access to this. Registered banks do with deposits. So during the GFC, the last of the independent investment banks, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, were transformed into commercial banks over a single weekend. So they could get access to liquidity from the Federal Reserve. Now in a non-crisis, I work for Goldman Sachs, in a non-crisis period, the conversion to a commercial bank from an investment bank would have taken years and years and years and thousands of lawyers. This was done overnight recognising they had, they had to become commercial banks to access money. Now during the GFC, no Australian bank reported an accounting loss in even one quarter, let alone any capital loss. Nevertheless, nevertheless the entire banking system faced an acute liquidity crisis. Access to offshore funding, <coughs> which is a structural component, was becoming more and more restricted and it was going to impact the economy. So on October the 12th, Wayne Swan, the Treasurer, announced that the offshore, all the offshore borrowings Australian banks would receive the sovereign AAA rating. In effect, he guaranteed over $1 trillion of bank borrowings with taxpayers' money. Now, the Irish government did the same thing. The difference was, firstly, that the Australian financial system had a, a crisis and a liquidity problem. It didn't have a fundamental problem with its asset quality. So it had a liquidity crisis, it didn't have an asset quality crisis. And they're very, very different, what's called a solvency crisis. Secondly, and most importantly, his predecessor, the Peter Costello, had eliminated all federal government debt. And therefore, the international markets looked at Australia and said, yeah, they're good for the money. That AAA guarantee, yeah, we'll bank that. So money came back into the Australian system. When we look at this going forward, the impact of our federal debt on this problem is, is going to be something I address. Now, I'm going to address, to now turn to the issue of bank failures, the good, the bad, and the truly ugly, which then sets the too big to fail conundrum which is confronting global regulators in Australia and globally. As we know, there's been numerous financial crises. I've talked about the Wall Street crisis and the GFC. 
There's also been regional crises in South America, Asia and Central Europe which have impacted these important economies throughout, throughout, the last, uh, throughout the last century. And there's been a great deal of research about what caused it. Ben Bernanke, of course, famously studied the Wall Street crash as part of his PhD in uh, an MIT. Now, in the normal course of an industrial company that fails, liquidity is appointed by the creditors or a court. The business is either sold or broken up. An asset sold over a period of time. The process can take many years. Creditors stand in line and hope that they're going to get some money back on their investment. That's what happens in the corporate world. This cannot happen with a bank because the creditors are its depositors and transactors through the payment system. In short, as banks have become bigger, a bank failure is simply too big an event and the consequences the economy as a whole too profound to be subject to a traditional liquidation process. So failed banks do not go through bankruptcy. They go through a process of resolution until they become resolved. And by resolve, we mean ownership is transformed either by a recapitalization or a sale, often forced by the regulator, to a larger bank. Banks have to be resolved so that the deposit and transaction activities can go on even when a bank's capital has been exhausted. In the 1980s, during the US banking crisis, Congress established the Resolution Trust Company to acquire, recapitalize, and then sell fell banks across the country, which is why I worked in Texas. And Resolution has an important psychological terminology because for deposit borrowers, a banking crisis by definition is being resolved. It's a resolution, it's not a failure. However, in multiple situations I've worked on, the taxpayer is first called upon to underwrite the resolution process with some returning capital in, in later years as banks are transferred to private sector ownership either through the sale of the institution or to another bank or sell through the public markets which is being currently being undertaken in the United Kingdom with two of its four high street banks. So the issue that governments central bankers and financial regulators confront is we're looking at two different risks. A financial system that does not finance innovators, entrepreneurs, exporters and the MSC sector as a whole will dampen economic growth and constrain national productivity. But a system which finances asset bubbles will inevitably result in distortions, then economic dislocation, including taxpayer funded bailouts, recession unemployment. The Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan famously described the role of the central bank as a Goldilocks economy. Not too hot, not too cold, just about right. Now, in Australia's case, we actually may have the worst of both worlds. That is a financial sector which is limiting our national productivity by not sufficiently supporting our innovators, entrepreneurs and the SME sector as a whole while facilitating a potential asset bubble in domestic housing, which no surprises creates huge returns to bank shareholders through the favorable capital treatment of mortgages I referred to earlier. Indeed, David Murray has warned of potential correction to Australian asset prices in both residential properties and the share market, as has RBA Governor Glenn Stevens. Now, by and large, with a small institution, effectively, if it fails, it's sold to a larger institution. But what about really huge, complex institutions that are critically important, either a single country or, in fact, to the entire global economy? Welcome to the too big to fail conundrum, the new paradigm in financial services in which regulators have overturned the sensible advice given about bankers as far back as the New Testament. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all of those who sold and bought in the temple and he overtold the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons, Gospel of Matthew. Now in 1984, Continental Illinois, which was then the seventh largest bank by deposits in the United States, experienced a run by large depositors, interbank lending, 
following news that it incurred significant losses in its loan portfolio. Concerns that a failure of Continental would have significant adverse effects on the US bank's system led the US Federal Reserve, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation and the control of the currency to take the unprecedented action of assuring all of Continental's depositors, large and small, that their money was fully protected. More importantly, during congressional hearings after Continental's resolution, the comptroller of the currency indicated the 11th, sorry, the, the 11 largest banks in the United States were too big to fail and would not be allowed to fail. So the emergence of too big to fail institutions in the 1980s intersected with moves to deregulate the financial sector, permitting greater competition between institutions and therefore risk taking. And a series of financial crises, culminating with the GFC in 2008, has exposed taxpayers to the massive costs of a deregulated financial markets operating side by side with a too big to fail regulatory regime. Indeed, since Continental annoyed the size, the scope and the global reach and complexity of too big to fail bank fails, fail banks has increased significantly over the past three decades. This has made the moral hazard faced by regulators even more problematic. Now, following what I want to show now is um, the Continental Illinois uh, resolution cost $7.3 billion, which in 1984 was a pretty eye-watering number. What we have now, after the GFC, was an IMF report called the Fiscal Implication of the Global Economic and Financial Crisis, which looked at four areas of support, capital injection, asset purchases, central banking support, and guarantees for the financial sector liabilities. In all, the IMF estimated the total support for the financial sector was over 50% of GDP for advanced G20 countries, with the United States at 81%, the United Kingdom at 82% of GDP and Australia at only 9.5% of GDP. And currently there are 29 too big to fail banks which according to the Financial Stability Board pose a threat to the entire global economy if they were to fail. Not all of them individually. And these banks, these 29, are not only too big to fail but require additional capital. That was just released in November last year. Now the four major Australian banks are not too big to fail in a global context, but they are in the context of Australia and New Zealand. And what's evident from this slide is that Europe, which accounts for a quarter of global GDP, accounts for half of the world's too big to fail banks. Now, since the GFC, there has been a significant body of work undertaken by regulators internationally about how to eliminate this moral hazard of taxpayers being forced to provide hundreds of billions and even trillions of dollars to the financial sector in the event of another, i.e. the next financial crisis. So topics under discussion include credit rationing, deposit insurance, too big to fail capital, stress test capital, bail-in bonds, guarantee fees, structural separation and non-operating holding companies. I was going to write about all of these but then I realised that you probably want to go to home for dinner because each of these re requires a substantive discussion in their own right but I will look at some of these in terms of the, the, my recommendations on the Murray Report. So in the Murray Report reference is made to a potential failure or bailout of one of the domestic trading banks. One of them. But what happens if two or three of these banks actually failed? What would be the consequence of the economy, the provision of finance and, and public sector debt in this event? To this end, the financial crisis which engulfed the United Kingdom in 2008 is highly instructive to what could happen in the event there was a major systemic asset-based event in our country and a graphic illustration of the impacts on the economy 
when two big banks to fail actually fail. So let's let's just go back to the UK briefly because I want to talk about recommendations, and I'll try to get out people out for a reasonable time for dinner. Um, as I said, I'll I'll make available the the twenty fourth uh, thousand uh, word version uh, in the next few days. So if we look at the UK, which I'll get into, the percentage of banking assets to GDP in the UK is more than double that of Australia. But its culture, political system and legal framework is very similar. Now, we think about London as a major global financial hub and we think with so many people there, there'd be a plethora of banks offering mortgages to the household sector and SME loans and to business loans. This is not actually the case. The UK has four high street banks, namely Barclays, HSBC after the acquisition of Midland, Lloyd's TSB and Royal Bank of Scotland. So a high street bank is a large retail bank found on the high street of any commercial town. Sort of like Main Street in America. And these high street banks are as important to the UK economy as the four major trading banks are to the Australian economy. And during 2008, during the GFC, RBC and Lloyds were the subject of a government-sponsored bailout and at one point Barclays is very close to requiring government assistance. Now in truth, because I was advising NAB on the acquisition of Abbey National and when we looked at NAB National's ca uh, ca true capital ratios we were stunned that they were about a quarter of NAB's, if less, with the same rating. So the balance sheet strength was considerably less than the Australian counterparts and their asset composition far riskier. So these banks did not suffer a liquidity event, but a fundamental dip diminution of asset quality, such that RBS and Lloyds became insolvent and had to be bailed out by the taxpayers. And as we've seen, the cost of the taxpayer in the United Kingdom in terms of the GFC is absolutely enormous in, in terms of GDP costs and, and public sector finances. But in reality, the only difference between the UK and Australia is they're too big, they're too, uh, too big to fail banks failed and ours haven't. They have the unenjoyable experience of dealing with this after it happened where we can deal with it before it happens which is really what I'm talking about with my uh, submission to the Murray inquiry. Now there's a fantastic book you should read, I think every bank director should read it called Shredded Inside RBS, the bank that broke Britain by Ian, Ian Fraser. And I'll quickly go through it. There's one lesson we learned from the financial crisis that giant, world straddling, universal banks like RBS under good Fred would make little or no economic sense. Rather than helping the broader economy, they tend to exploit implicit government subsidies, sound familiar, in order to rent seek with their own raison debt being to enrich their own management. Not only too big to fail, they are too big to manage, too big to regulate, and too big to prosecute. The only short-term solution for such financial behemoths is to break them up into more manageable chunks. <coughs> that way they are more likely to focus on serving the needs of the real economy in geographies in which they focus and less likely to prioritise negative behaviour like rent-seeking and empire building. Smaller banks find it difficult to hold a gun to the government's head and the re-regulation of the banking sector, which is certainly occurring in the UK, ought to hold the government to ransom should they get into difficulties. So in the United Kingdom, we have seen regulators imposing credit rationing, ring-fencing so-called risky activities, taking them away from deposit, the deposit side, deposit-taking institutions, into institutions that are funded separately, look at the competitive landscape, and even determining who will be on the boards and management of these institutions in what is known as a fit and proper test. Before you go onto a UK bank or insurance board, you are interviewed by the regulator who will then determine if you are fit and proper to go on that board. Sir so John Vickers undertook a comprehensive review of the UK banking system and made some recommendations about structural separation of risky activities. And further, just, just in July this year, the Competition and Markets Authority announced it was launching an in-depth investigation into, pos into competition in the UK banking market with a possible breakup of the high street banks. So they are actively looking at this. All the things that, that could be on the agenda for the Murray inquiry are actually being done in the UK as we speak. So let's get to the reason you're here, which is talk about the Australian uh, financial sector's 
reforms recommended. So what we've observed is that almost any, unlike any other business, the risks undertaken and the returns to shareholders in the financial sector and the banking sector in particular are greatly influenced, if not determined, by regulators in each country and increasing globally. By virtue of obtaining a license to operate in the financial sector, companies within it, public or private, submit themselves to a regulatory architecture which is as comprehensive as it is overarching. It's regulators, not shareholders, nor boards that determine how much capital each institution requires, how much how assets will be risk weighted, and even how much risk institutions can assume on their balance sheets by promulgating rules on counterparty risk, geographic risk, concentration risk, liquidity risk and the like. That's what regulators do. It's also not commonly understood, but in the financial sector, there's an inherent conflict of interest between the Council of Financial Regulators and the competition regulator, the ACCC. Because the CFR is focused on the stability of the financial system and the economy as a whole, whereas the ACCC is simply focused on competition. Put simply, a freewheeling, highly competitive banking system in which loans are freely available to finance asset bubbles and any other corporate activity would not be a problem for the ACCC, as long as it's competitive. It'd be a very big problem for the CFR. But through its legislative remit, regular authority and sheer political power, the Council of Financial Regulators is far more influential in shaping the structure, the administration and everything else that goes on in a financial sector and the ACCC is a marginal player at best. Indeed, in the context of the Murray Inquiry, the Treasury, the RBA and APRA have all made submissions. Does it not strike one as more than curious that the ACCC, the competition regulator, has not made any submissions at all? In other words, the ACCC has absolutely nothing to say about the current environment in our financial system or how competition could be enhanced. Indeed, the RBA has been quite explicit in pointing out the risk of additional competition and whether borrowing changes, quote, might accelerate household borrowing and the associated implications for systemic risk and the available funding for Australian business. However, I do not think it's good public policy when an inquiry investigating the most important sector of the economy is simply bereft of the views of the agency charged with competition in that sector. The most important symbol of competition in the financial sector, of course, was first promulgated in 1990 by the Honourable Paul Keating as the Six Pillars Policy, which was the four banks plus the two insurance companies, AMP and AXA, and then, re and then reaffirmed by Peter Costello and every treasurer since as the Four Pillars Policy, and under this policy, the four major trading banks are not permitted to merge with each other. However, this is not an ACCC guideline. It's a statement of political philosophy with the power to maintain it or modifying it resting with the Treasurer. The Wallace Inquiry of 1997 assumed there would be such contestability in the financial sector, including new entrants, it actually recommended elimination of the Four Pillars policy, which fortunately wasn't adopted. Indeed, since Wallace, the Australian financial service sector has been transformed by a rolling series of acquisitions by the four major trading banks and the exiting of most of the new market entrants from the 1980s. In the banking sector, Westpac acquired St George. And Combac acquired Bank West in the same year. With the end of St George and Bank West's independent entities, the opportunity of creating a fifth real competitor of the major, major trading banks was lost. In my view, the acquisition of St George by Westpac, in particular, should never have been allowed by the ACCC. and should not have been allowed by the Treasurer, the Honourable Wayne Swan. I know that it would have never been permitted by Peter Costello or Alan Fells because when they were announced, I actually discussed this with them and they were appalled. 
The St George transaction in particular is anti-competitive and worse, exacerbates the too big to fail problem facing Australian financial regulators today. So let's look at what's happened to the Australian banking sector since the St George acquisition. This is a graph that looks at the combined profits of the Australian banks since that time and plots these against increase in Australia's GDP. The GDP is on the bottom line. What you'll see is a banking sector that in five years has gone from a profit of $10 billion to a profit of $30 billion and this year the equity analysts are forecasting even higher profits. Here is a chart that compares return on equity of Australia's four major trading banks and their current market capitalisation to book value, what's called price to book, compared with other large global banks. Now before we had the Australian banks at the lower end of size comparisons, but when it comes to their valuation, they are at the very top of global banks anywhere in the world. Our banking system is producing banks that have the highest returns in equity and the highest price to book values of any banks in the world. When we look at the ratings of the major global banks, I want to say two things. First of all, look at the ratings of the Australian banks and the Canadian banks, because if we go back to this chart, have a look at the other people with the highest ROEs, and the highest price to books, the Canadian banks. So you've got concentrated banking systems, you've got high ratings, and you've got high ROEs and, and high price to books. And there's a reason for this, and that is they're not taking enough risk, which I'll get into later on. But I'd also like to point out that in Germany, the banking system seems to operate very well with single A banks, as does the United States, as does the UK banking system, and indeed all the global investment banks are rated single A. Indeed, in the global system, Australia and Canada are total outliers. The rest of the world operates with single A banks very nicely. What I've done here is to look at the combined provision for loan losses of the four major Australian banks over the last decade. It may seem counterintuitive, but a banking system which is both highly profitable and has negligible loan losses is not competitive and it's risk averse. And that is a transfer of wealth from, from the users of banks to the owners of banks, which is absolutely clear in this chart. Now I'm not advocating going back to the 1980s, the go-go years, that was a bit of fun with Alan Bond and all the others, but it is very clear from just these charts that the pendulum has swung way too far the other way. So now Australia has a significant structural and systemic problem with its financial sector, which put simply is dominated by four very profitable banks that benefit from unusually high credit ratings, creating an, an unlevel playing field with the few small remaining banks in the economy. And the, the ratings of the majors incorporate the implicit support of the Australian government. The four major trading banks are all too big to fail and have created a regulatory, con regulatory conundrum in which APRA is forced to favour bank shareholders compared with borrowers in order to bank depositors. In other words, because they can't have the banks failing. And as the GFC demonstrated, when push comes to shove, the Australian government has been forced to uh, guarantee the liabilities of these institutions in order to protect the financial system. <clears throat> it is axiomatic that the greater the proportion of banking assets to GDP, banking assets to GDP, the greater proportion, the more reliant an economy is on its banking sector and the more at risk an economy becomes with the failure of this sector. So what we have here is a demonstration of banking assets as a percentage of GDP. Now Australia is not an outlier compared with Europe and 
The problem for Europe is its banking crisis continues to wash back on the economy. But look at the United States. So the reliance on banks to intermediate credit is clearly evident in Europe and Australia. But what's also evident is that the US, despite representing a quarter of the world's GDP, has a financial system in which banks play a far less role in the provision of credits and the bond markets are deep, broad and diverse and far more important the economy. So on a proportionate basis, there are far fewer too big to, bank, to fail banks in the United States than in Europe or Australia. Yes, they have a few, but not relative to the size of the economy. Our entire financial system is for too big to fail banks. So that allows the Americans, their entrepreneurs, SMEs and larger corporates significantly more financial flexibility and access to credit. Well, now that we have the financial system we do, what are we going to do about it, if anything? As David Murray himself said, the essence of this inquiry is about funding the economy and the financial crisis toll is not straightforward. Now, there are basically three broad approaches. <clears throat> there's been thousands of submissions. But there's three broad approaches being taken by, the, by people putting in submissions. In the first instance, the BCA, Business Council of Australia, which incorporates the large um, Australian companies, domestic and international financial institutions, and multinational corporations wants the status quo to prevail. The concern of the BCA is that any additional costs, such as additional capital that might be required by the regulators to try to prevent the banks being too big to fail, will be borne by business customers rather than bank shareholders. It's interesting. So from an economic perspective, one could reasonably infer that the BCA believes that our banks have sufficient market power to transfer costs back to customers reflecting an oligopoly. That's the BCA submission. Because as we know, in highly contestable and competitive sectors of the economy, pricing power of this magnitude is limited at best. The second approach taken is what I would call status quo with a twist of line. This would be the position of our financial regulators that would say, look, our banking sector has demonstrated its stability and resilience since, uh, during, since the world's worst financial crisis of the Great Depression. So yes, the sovereign rating was required to support the financial system in the depths of crisis, but only for a limited period of time. They're also concerned about the too big to fail problem and would like to have some additional capital. And they'd probably like to have a deposit protection system to build up a capital buffer, etc. And they would say, look, Thanks to the 1990 crisis that we went through, the rest of the world didn't. And thanks to the problems of the uh, HIH in early 2000, which really got APRA, which really took APRA by surprise and reformed APRA after that, then we were ahead of the curve. And therefore, we don't need to have the same regulations that the rest of the world is looking at because they had a problem with their financial system and we didn't. So they're saying, Let's do a bit of tinkering, a bit of extra capital, a bit of this, a bit of that. It's what I call with a twist of, uh, it's always got a twist of line. The final approach taken <clears throat> by a guy called Joel Dals John, John Dalson, who is a former uh, long standing director of the ANZ, he was the chairman of the audit committee. He's a former chairman of Woolworths and a founder of Southern Cross Broadcasting, is the Australian financial system is not sufficiently competitive and contestable. Financial regulators and conservative bank boards have skewed lending away from risk-taking activities in lending to SMEs and small corporates and increasingly focused on housing loans to the detriment of the economy as a whole. One of the most important roles of the financial system is to intermediate credit across a wide, a wide spectrum of risks. And provided there's appropriate pricing for risk, this allows for a more productive and innovative economy. Increasing regulation and the virtual elimination of the regional banking sector has driven out competition. Dalson states in his submission to the Murray Inquiry, the interim report has been prepared by bankers 
on behalf of bankers for bankers. The challenge of re-establishing a balanced system without compromising one of the best supervised systems in the world is not easy. Growing bank concentration and profitability will only serve to increase public anger over the lack of competitive and inferior service. Now, we do know that the ACCC did not make a submission to the Murray Inquiry, but we also know that John Dalson, who wrote a 200-page submission, has not been invited by the Murray Inquiry to ventilate his views. So it's imperative in, for Australia, in the context of Murray and most generally, that we have a hard look at the way we are going to become a more innovative and technologically advanced society, particularly given the, the problems and the demographic challenges that face in the years and decades ahead. In a recent report, Moody has noted that in six years, the world will have 13 super-aged nations. So by 2020, by 30, there'll be 34 by 2030. A super-aged country is one in which more than one person in five in the population is over 65. So we've got three now. We will have 13 in six years. We'll have 34 in 2013, 2013. Moody's estimates that by 2030, 19.2% of Australians and 20.1% of New Zealanders will fall into this category. Now, as youthful as I am, I will unfortunately contribute to this problem myself. And indeed, the OECD predicted that ageing will slow global growth down from an average of 3.6% this decade to 2.4% between 2050 and 2060. So innovation cannot exist without the funding to sustain it, nor without a society that's embracing of it. Unfortunately, older people tend to be more risk adverse and empirically contribute less to innovation. I'm exceptionalist, of course, which is clear from such things as university research papers, new patent applications, Nobel Prizes. So we have to work out a way as we age to get the settings right to fund our younger innovators. So we actually need a broader societal change in respect of innovation, entrepreneurship and risk taking that we as a country need to address if we are to become another US or even in Israel, a, a, population, a country with a population of 8 million that is producing incredible innovation. So people look at the United States and say, well, yeah, it's the US. Well, uh, Israel is leading the world in innovation uh, with, with 8 million people. So this has not got something to do with, with the financial markets per se. It's how we address business failure. In Silicon Valley, Business failure is not regarded as a stigma the way it is in Australia. It's regarded as a lesson learned that will make an entrepreneur better in another venture. Angel investors and venture capital funds look at their investments as a portfolio, with, me with many enterprises failing, but those that succeed more than compensating the investors for the risk they've taken. It's quite common in the US and in Israel for entrepreneurs to fail a number of businesses but still attract new funding on the basis of that's a good business plan. Henry Ford had a number of failed businesses himself before he founded Ford Motor Company. But in Australia, we treat business failure as an irrecoverable character flaw. And our bankruptcy laws in the context of promoting innovation entrepreneurship need drastic changes to eliminate their Dickensian nature. For example, an individual who's declared bankrupt cannot travel overseas without the permission of their trustee during five years. These are not teenagers, these are adults. In other respects, people who are bankrupt are treated worse than individuals with minor criminal convictions in the justice system. Further, if as an individual you have a workout, you work out an accommodation with your financier, that you don't go to bankruptcy, there is a permanent record of this on a database which anybody in the public can access. So you don't even have to become bankrupt to have this, the, the, the stigma of financial failure. We demonise this even through financial arrangements with creditors. It may be of some comfort to the financial sector, but it has major societal implications. And it's extraordinary in my view that privacy laws 
do not extend to those who are made bankrupt. And frankly, from a GDP perspective, or even lost the financial system, these individuals who lose everything are absolutely a rounding error. Our financial system is too risk averse to creating a culture of innovation, failure included. Now, the Treasury is rightly concerned about Australia's productivity challenge and how we can sustain growth over the past the next five years. Uh, and it sounds a bit counterintuitive, but I sort of think our mining boom created a culture of complacency, which we can ill afford given the demographic tax ahead of this country. Because the mining boom left away once in a generation, maybe once in three generations, improvement in terms of trade into Australian dollar. And this dollar problem is exacerbated by a, a reversal of budget surpluses into budget deficits for a sustained period, forcing the Reserve Bank to maintain far higher interest rates than the rest of the world and facilitating a carry trade which oversees investors purchase Australian bonds and other securities. People don't realise that the, de the deficit funding, which didn't need to happen, actually had interest rate consequences, which we are now unwinding now. Now, around the world, central banks and other market participants are saying there's, a, there's an asset bubble occurring, which is resulting from long periods of liquidity and low interest rates. We're now seeing regulators in the US and Europe applying greater interest rates, and we've seen a sharp decline of the Australian dollar even recently. But even with these more competitive, if we become more competitive as a result of a better exchange rate, this in itself does not lead to a higher standard of living. You actually need to have real economic growth to maintain real wage growth. And for this to occur, because it's the largest employer in, in our country, it's got to be better connected to the global economy. There's an institution called EFIC, which is actually asked to assist to support, to support the SME sector. It's 100% owned by the federal government. And there's a lot of efficacy around the world. 80% uh, of EFIC loans are made to the SMEs, and these loans are made to assist exporters. They're made on commercial terms. EFIC's got a loan book of $2 billion and provides a dividend to its shareholder. It's commercially viable. But EFIC's $2 billion SME export loan book is a drop in the ocean with the $3 trillion of assets in the banking system, particularly focused on housing. But the problem's worse for the SME sector because if you are not an SME that is looking for export credit, there is no other facility apart from the banks that you can turn to. There is no equivalent in Australia for an, for a, for an EFIC if you just want to expand. So then the question in the context that Murray inquiry is, well, why does EFIC need to play this role if it's making money providing export facilitation for, for SMEs? That, that is an example of market failure. And also, from a national productivity perspective, housing loans have increased from $3 billion per annum in, 2000, sorry, in, in 1990 to $23 billion in 2014. We have had a seven-fold increase in housing loans in 14 years. Let's go back to the thought about asset bubbles and how they're financed and think about that. And yet... 23 billion of housing credit, of new housing credit, but there's only a $2 billion book uh, for, for uh, SMEs exporting. So we have a bit of a bind in our financial system because we need to actually think about what system we need to have. We have four banks, very profitable, too big to fail, regulator can't let them fail, and even if they wanted to extend more broader lending, the regulator is too concerned about them doing that because, that, because in case they lose money and the system's threatened. We also have then had, through regulatory arbitrage, money being directed to domestic housing, and we now have the high, highest proportion of domestic housing anywhere in the world. A complete outlier. Now, given the, the future shocks will be inevitable. That is, that is, there will be future shocks to the system. So unless something's done, there could come a day of reckoning in our financial markets, which is happening in the United Kingdom. You know, the United Kingdom is not some sort of third world economy. It's very, very similar. It, it, it lost uh, two out of its four banks and, uh, and, and almost a third. And a banking crisis 
did engulf this country 25 years ago, and I worked at the very epicentre. I worked on virtually all the state bank recapitalizations that I referred to, uh, and I worked on all the demutualizations. And when Westpac needed the $1 billion to actually sustain it, I managed to get my firm, which was then First Boston, to put its entire capital up to save Westpac as a 36-year-old. It wouldn't happen today because the regulators wouldn't allow it in the United States, but we, put, we did that. This, this could happen again. And why could it happen again? Well, Australia's got a number of headwinds. First of all, public sector debt has blown out. And even with a horror budget, taxation receipts as proportion of GDP are still below revenue increases. And which means we have a continued degeneration in our net debt over the foreseeable future. So things, things have not actually improved there. Secondly, global economies, particularly the US and Europe, have not even rebounded their PGST levels. And with China slowing, there is more than a statistical risk of another global banking crisis. And we are, we are seeing regulators talking about that right now. Thirdly, with a less rosy outlook for mining exports, there are greater uncertainties about the long-term growth. And fourthly, unemployment's been on the uptick for several quarters, with concern about oversupply of white-collar workers and university graduates. So Australia has not had a recession in nearly 25 years, again a complete outlier, and our, fund, and our financial system has therefore never had to go through the economic stress of the rest of the OECD only several years ago. So we haven't, we haven't, had, to, we haven't had to do this yet, everybody else has done it. So what is the ultimate stress test? It's a real recession. As I mentioned before, thanks to the elimination of the government debt under Peter Costello, Australian banks were, were able to fund themselves in the worst of this. But because our financial, sectors, uh, our financial sector uh, was a lot more sound, our finances, well, because we had no debt, it was an easy thing to say. We may not be so well positioned in, for the next crisis because our public sector finances have deteriorated markedly and uh, we're also a major importer of credit and capital, which is needed to sustain our economic growth now to the future. So our public sector position has got a lot worse, yeah. unemployment's ticking up, and we need foreign capital, both equity and debt, to grow. So there has to be mature discussion about the potential impact of weakened and weakening public sector finances on the sovereign credit rating, our relative attractiveness to providers of offshore debt, and whether in the next crisis we can sustain that blink moment when these creditors decide will they or will they not extend liquidity to the Australian system? Because effectively that's the moment they say yes or no. So there's been little public policy discussion about what is required to maintain Australia's AAA sovereign rating and the confidence of offshore investors generally. So what do we do? Do we, leave, do we leave with the current financial system and hope that she'll be right, mate? Do we put some incremental changes in and hope that she'll be right, mate? Or do we actually say we need to actually do something else? Now, the she'll be right, mate approach of the BCA and the trading banks is actually a lost cause, not only respect to the Murray inquiry, but because Australian international regulators are actually moving to increase capital and to put in things like bail-in bonds. And those domestically who think that the efforts internationally to eliminate the too big to fail conundrum will rather obligingly just ignore the financial Australian financial system are deluding themselves. So there are lots of things our financial regulators can do in the context of uh, tinkering at the edges. Uh, one of them is, I'm gonna go through this quickly with them because of time, but one of them is to put in a, a, an offshore tax on borrowings offshore. Uh, another is, uh, is, uh, is deposit insurance. And the idea of putting a tax offshore would be to sort of say, what, what is the arbitrage, um, what is the arbitrage gained by the big banks by virtue of this AA rating? Or you could use bail-in bonds as another alternative, which is what we've seen in Canada. Now, interestingly enough, Canada is actually looking at this and the credit rating agents have said, oh, with bail-in bonds, bail-in bonds are where 
in a financial crisis, the bondholders have to bail in capital into the bank. So they're a kind of a hybrid instrument. They're a, they're a, they're a composition of, of let, let's say you, you lend $100 billion to an Australian bank, you'll get your 90, your 90 billion back, but 10 stays with the system ahead of time. So the, that's where bail-in bonds work. Uh, the Canadian banks have now all been, they're on negative credit outlook. So when the Canadians have said, we're gonna transfer some of the risks from the taxpayer to bondholders, Lo and behold, the credit agents said, well, actually, that's bad for the bondholders, which it is, but it's good for the taxpayers. So the, the Canadian banks are now on negative credit watch. We've got to reduce our offshore reliance on offshore funds, and we've got to, we've got to fix this uh, tax bias against... So we have, we have a bias for bank dividends, we have a bias against deposit, uh, domestic deposit. Now, if, you're, if, you're, if you lend money to Australia, you only pay a 10% with, withholding tax on Australian deposits. If an Australian, you may pay 50%, which is, which is pretty crazy. So I think that what we should do is to adjust the tax system. If you have a deposit for more than two years, that it, that'll attract a 10% rate, and more than five years, zero tax, that will actually get people to put more money in the banking system. Um, I believe that the current approach by APRA to the difference between regional banks having a hard risk-weighted assets on, on domestic housing and the major trading banks uh, effectively having the advanced model that needs to be scrapped. These trading banks that are going to 35%, that will increase their capital quite significantly, but it'll put them on a competitive level playing field and will add uh, capital to the system. Um, the, so look, that's basically what I wanted to talk about in terms of um, as is, but what we need to what we need to now look at is um, is what should a system look like, and what I'd like to do here is to sort of pose a question to you all: Would Australia be better off with eight to ten single A banks, all competing vigorously, with a single A rating, which is exactly like the rest of the OECD? and relying on domestic deposits to fund their activities and specialising in other areas, or do we want to continue infinitum with four big banks that are, are the economy and, and, to use, and which use the Australian government rating to, to, uh, to uh, access low-cost offshore funding? So I think this is the fundamental question that has to be asked in the context of the Murray Inquiry. What system do we actually need to support the Australian economy? So what should, a, what should a, a, a good system have? Well, it should provide a wide range of competitive offerings to individuals and businesses. Customers should have, have access to different products and services at prices which do not reflect an oligopolistic situation. They reflect a competitive market situation. In a knowledge-based economy, entrepreneurs, innovators and new businesses need to have access to capital across a wide range of spectrums. Bankruptcy laws should reflect a political philosophy that business failure is not a stigma uh, and, and that pricing for risk models undertaken by the banks and other institutions actually incorporate losses into them. That's what pricing for risk is. If you price for risk and you have no losses, well, people have paid for that risk, but the, but the shells have actually got the benefit. We need to actually reverse that and let entrepreneurs actually get more money. So we need, we need a more, much more flexible banking uh, uh, bankruptcy rules. Um, again, we need to look at pricing for risk. We need to make sure that shareholders do get rewarded for the risk they're taking. That is absolutely essential. They need to be well capitalised and attract new, new money, but they should be free of implicit tax subsidies and they should be in a competitive setting. Uh, we need to make sure that if, if banks are borrowing offshore at increasing rates to, to fund domestic housing, that we have the mechanisms in place to actually limit that because we, we cannot have asset bubbles because they, they impact our deposit protection. And new technologies should be encouraged, uh, subject to stringent anti-fraud. We need to have a superannuation system. And the superannuation system is kind of interesting because it's sort of, it was part of an accord and suddenly it's suddenly become a massive number. Uh, and we actually don't know, it's sort of, we don't have a national policy around it, so we need to do that. We also need one that's less trustee driven. The trustee effectively goes to one or two uh, Asset allocators, they say, do this and do that. We have a one-size-fits-all, so you get the same advice when you're 20 as when you're 60. We need to actually change that, and we also need to adjust provincial supervision. So how do we actually do this? Well, this is going to require breaking a few eggs. 
and taking on powerful vested interests. We're going to t if, we, if we actually want a competitive banking system with eight to 10 players, we're going to have to break up the existing players to achieve that, which is what they're looking at in the UK. So who's got the power and authority to actually do that? Well, the Council of Financial Regulators and the Treasurer. Why doesn't the Treasurer announce an eight pillars policy and saying we want eight, eight banks in the system? Well, how would you do that? They have absolutely, our Treasurer of our regulators have enormous powers at their disposal to achieve this. And they can say this in the guise of resilience against the next financials, financial shocks. They can actually already have the power to break the oligopoly by increasing capital, by simply saying over the next few years, we intend to increase the capital allocated against two big to bank fail, two, two bank to fail banks until, until they become smaller. The, it, allows, it allows the bank boards to say, this capital bit will be too great, we should become smaller. Now in the, in the uh, corporate sector, you will see demergence happening all the time. People say our business units don't work with each other, etc. There is absolutely no reason why this can't be done in the financial sector. What it requires is enormous political will and it requires the regulators to actually sit back and discuss and level with people and say, here's the kind of system we need to allow entrepreneurs to develop, to allow for economic growth. Finally, it needs a charter that says competition is equally as important as provincial, prudential supervision. We need to have competition and we need to balance that off with, with the supervisory processes, but we can't eliminate competition or dumb it down. So I'm looking to have a, uh, this, this council supervised by, not supervised, informed by a board of business people, of people who are interested in competition policy and people from the onto the entrepreneurial sector, the innovation sector, to actually have a counterweight to the natural balance of, of financial regulation, which is to be conservative. So the other thing it needs to do, and this is going to be, again, controversial in political terms, is to allow this council to have a discussion about the direction of public sector finances, because after all, they are something we rely upon, not just to the forward estimates, but beyond that. The information's there, they're just not allowed to comment on it. So we need to have a group that actually says, if, if the trajectory of our public sector finance is going this way, we could very well have a liquidity problem in the future. So look, by its nature, as you've seen, banking and financial service are complex and difficult to fathom, but I believe it's incumbent on financial regulators to talk about what they want, what system is good for Australia, and then to articulate that position and then go and do it. We need to have objectives of sustainable growth, sound public finances and full employment and then implement the policies. So you can have motherhood statements say we'd like to have a bond market and then actually go and do it. Finally, because I know you want to leave and go to some dinner, we have a financial sector inquiry that is the whim of the government. We've had only three in 35 years. Now, if we think about, if we go back to the Campbell Inquiry of 1981, no reference to derivatives. And yet, five, ten years later, derivatives were an integral part of the entire banking system. And in fact, that ended up, they ended up with the end of Glass-Steagall. Wallace Inquiry, 1997. No mention of internet banking wasn't invented. One of the most important things we do now is in internet banking. So what will be the next innovations that are beyond the scope of anything considered by the Murray Inquiry that may be here in 10 years' time that completely change the way we interact. So basically, we need to have a, a council that is constantly reviewing, recalibrating the financial system according to our economic needs and not have an inquiry once every 15 years. And lastly, I'd like to seek forgiveness from my parents. My father, Thomas Walton, has an academic degree from, from the London School of Economics. And without wishing to be cruel, he has benefited enormously as a shareholder from the structure of the current financial system. His bank shares have been a wonderful investment, particularly since St George was acquired by Westpac. He has made a lot of money and he does not at all like my observations and recommendations I showed to him. So I seek my parents' forgiveness for this heretical lecture because selfishly I'm more concerned about the Australia of my children than I am of my parents' generation. Thank you very much.